Welcome to the next session about life under the sea. Before we begin, we're going to do a quick refresh about some of the things that we learnt last time about corallivores and herbivores. In the last presentation, we learnt that corallivores and herbivores are needed to keep the reef healthy. Corallivores eat, the clue is in the name, did you get it? Coral. This corallivore is called a butterfly fish. Some of the different species of butterfly fish are also named after animals. Can you remember what animal this butterfly fish is named after? It has big black spots over its eyes. That's it, a panda butterfly fish. Eclipse butterfly fish have this black spot on the back of their body. Why might this be helpful to the survival of this butterfly fish? This is a distraction for predators as they might think that the black spot is an eye. When the butterfly fish has its nose in the coral eating, the predator thinks that the butterfly fish is looking right at them and it won't attack. Parrotfish don't have teeth. Do you remember what they have instead? Think about a bird. It's basically the same. Did you remember? Parrotfish have dental plates or beaks instead of teeth. Can you remember why surgeon fish get their name from? Remember that surgeons are known for operations. Surgeon fish have a very sharp spine at the base of their tail. It's almost as sharp as a surgeon's knife or scalpel, which is where they get their name from. Right, let's dive in. We're going to be talking about some really interesting fish today, carnivores. You might be familiar with the term carnivores, but for those of you who haven't heard the word before, carnivores eat meat. Carne actually means meat in a few languages like Spanish. These are the next two groups in orange that are in the ocean ecosystem. You might know some land mammals that are carnivores. Can you think about animals that only eat meat? I can think of a lion or a fox. What did you think of? They are predators and they usually hunt smaller fish on the reef, but some bigger carnivores that we talk about might even hunt small sharks. The first fish we are going to talk about is the triggerfish. There are about 40 species of triggerfish and they are based mainly in warm tropical waters like around Thailand, Indonesia and Australia. They have really strong teeth which they use to eat their food, snails and sometimes sea urchins. They build nests which are dips in the sand or rubble on the bottom, which is where they lay their eggs. Triggerfish can grow to be up to 75 centimetres in length or about as long as an average one-year-old laying on the floor. All triggerfish have a spine that can get locked into an upright position, like you can see here in this picture. This spine is used to wedge themselves into little nooks and crannies so they can sleep without being dragged out of the coral by predators. Divers will often see this when the triggerfish feels threatened and it's a sign for the diver to move away. As I mentioned in my last video, it's very important to remember that we are visitors in the ocean, so we must always respect and care for the wildlife. Does my swimsuit look familiar? That's right, I'm dressed like a clown triggerfish just like in the picture. Red tooth or blue triggerfish are one of the only species of triggerfish which are seen in schools. Do you remember what a school of fish is? It's a group. A group of fish is called a school. Red tooth triggerfish form large schools and they eat zooplankton which are tiny creatures that float in the water. Do you know what the word territorial means? An area that you believe is yours or that you want to look after is called your territory. Your bedroom might be your territory, for example. And if you're territorial, it means you're very protective about your territory. The Titan triggerfish, like this one pictured here, is very territorial. They are often known to chase divers away if you get too close and they can bump into you or even try to bite you with their big front teeth. The next fish we're going to talk about is the grouper. Grouper average in size from about 30 centimetres all the way up to 3 metres in length for the larger species. They are often referred to as cod or rock cod in some countries, but they're all part of the same family. Grouper are usually quite shy and when they're out in the open they'll always be close to somewhere that they can hide, a rock or some coral. They are fairly solitary creatures which means they like to be by themselves and they only come together when it's time to reproduce. Some species of grouper might even travel for miles to get to the right place to reproduce. Grouper will eat anything from small crustaceans like shrimp or crabs to fish and sometimes even smaller sharks. Their mouths act like strong hoovers by opening their mouths quickly 
which sucks their prey into their mouth. Here you can see a peacock grouper eating a butterfly fish. We learned about butterfly fish in our last session. Groupers' mouths are filled with tiny little teeth that cover their jaw, tongue and the roof of their mouth, which hold the prey in place before they are swallowed whole. You can see these little teeth in this picture here of a potato grouper's mouth. Despite how they might look, grouper can move really fast when they want to. They hunt at night, often taking advantage of the confusion around dusk which is when the sun is setting, where most fish are finding somewhere to sleep to attack their prey. Can you think of any other animals that hunt at night? What about a bat or an owl? Grouper can also get a lot of parasites, which are little bugs which live on their skin and can irritate them or cause them discomfort. This is like when a dog or a cat might get fleas and it itches them like crazy. It can be really uncomfortable. So groupers often spend time on cleaning stations where a cleaner fish can eat the parasites off them. Okay, so the final fish we're going to talk about is the trevally, or the jackfish. There are almost 140 species of jacks, but we're only going to be talking about a couple of them today. They are really streamlined silvery fish, known for being very, very fast swimming hunters. Larger trevally are normally seen hunting by themselves or in small groups of between two and four. Their prey are fish that stray from protection of the reef and sometimes crustaceans like crabs or shrimp. They have forked tails which indicates that they are normally pelagic. Pelagic means they spend their time in deeper parts of the ocean. Can you say pelagic with me? Pelagic. Pelagic. Now a little bit of homework for you. I'd love it if you could show off your new learning and teach someone this new word, pelagic. Remember, pelagic. It means a fish that spends most of its time in deeper parts of the ocean. See how you get on. Smaller trevally or jackfish can often be found in schools on the edge of reefs and sometimes those big schools can form tornado or hurricane shapes underwater. The giant trevally, often called the GT by scuba divers, can grow to be over five foot in length. That's longer than me. I'm not very long, but still. They're darker silver in colour and can sometimes look black. Like some other fish, trevally can actually change their colour, which is really cool. Unlike many animals which change colour to camouflage or to blend into their surroundings, these fish actually change colour to communicate or talk to one another. Male big eye trevally change their colour from silver to black when they're mate, which you can see in this video here. Great work everyone, we learnt a lot again today. We started by reminding ourselves about some of the corallivores and herbivores that we can find in our oceans. These are the two blue sections in the ocean ecosystem here. Then we talked about some different carnivores, big and small. In next week's sessions, we're going to be talking about the apex predators on the reef, sharks. Sharks are one of my favourite creatures in the whole ocean, and I'm really excited to be sharing some cool facts about them with you. As always, there are lots of things that you can do to help protect the ocean, and these are also good for the planet as a whole. There are big things you can do to reduce the amount of plastic you use, like not using plastic bottles and not using straws. Remember, when you're at home, turn off the TV and turn off lights when you're not using them. By reducing the amount of electricity you use, you can actually help the ocean, which is brilliant. Try to look for sun cream that is reef safe. The less ingredients in the sun cream, the better. Try to reduce your carbon footprint. Take public transport, cycle or walk to get to school if you can. Take only pictures and leave only bubbles. Shells, coral or ocean souvenirs belong in the ocean so be sure to leave them at the beach. And finally, if you're in the water diving or snorkelling, remember not to touch the coral or the fish and just to enjoy the view. Thank you for watching. As with last time, there's a downloadable activity pack which is put together by my very clever friend Naomi with some questions, colouring in and drawing activities. For those of you without a printer, there is again an online quiz available. Don't forget to share pictures of your drawings and colouring in and let me know if you have any questions about the fish we spoke about in this lesson. And if you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe so you can get notified when the next lesson is available. Thank you and see you next time.